Hi folks, I'm Paul Roberts, and I'm excited to share with you the second in my series of documentaries on the behavior of largemouth bass. This one's been a while in the making, and shortly you'll see why. But before we roll into it, I'm putting the call out for help in allowing me to produce with more frequency the high content videos the nature of fishing is becoming known for and in making YouTube a viable venue for this kind of uh, truly labor-intensive content. Ad revenue alone just doesn't cover, and if you've seen much of my content, you'll understand that selling products isn't our focus here. So I've fired up a Patreon page to help interested viewers support the Nature of Fishing channel. If you like what you're seeing on The Nature of Fishing, find value in it, consider supporting me, um, us really, huh, through the, the, the Nature of Fishing Patreon page. I'll provide the link in the video description below. Uh, your contributions will allow me to use YouTube as a cost-effective venue for such in-depth, labor-intensive content. Uh, so thanks, folks, in advance for helping build The Nature of Fishing YouTube channel. Okay, business out of the way, let's get on to our second Bass Behavior documentary called Coming Into the World. I hope you enjoy it, and especially that it gives you stuff to chew on while you're out there trying to figure out just what's going on down there under that water. This story, the development of the largemouth bass, begins anew each and every spring, in the sunlit protected shallows of warm water lakes and ponds. Here, largemouths complete their cycle of reproduction, bringing the potentiality of a new year class into the world. Development refers to the changes each individual undergoes from birth to maturity. As ectotherms, or cold-blooded animals, a fish's activity, growth, and rate of development are temperature-dependent. However, the sequence of events, the developmental stages each little bass will undergo, is rigid, following a set of blueprints that were etched into their genetic code through a long history of evolutionary successes. In the early stages of development, our fish are equipped with a starter set of physical tools, hardware we could say, and still in the development phase. To get this hardware up and running, basic boot-up software is also provided, a set of fixed, reflexive behaviors, from which, as our fish grow and mature, will emerge behaviors that are more flexible, complex, and capable. Each individual carries the potential of realizing true super predator status and is able to shape the future of the other creatures it shares its waters with. Those relationships are reciprocal, however, and this fact goes a long way in explaining why sunfishes have evolved such deep bodies rimmed in formidable spines and, correspondingly, why bass have co-evolved such cavernous mouths. To reach maturity, however, each individual must earn its way, as a challenging road lies ahead, one of the most challenging in the animal kingdom. The first summer of life is essentially a race to beat the clock, as the coming winter, especially so in more northern parts of the species range, requires that young bass be well prepared for it. Those that make it through have beaten incredible odds to do so. Estimates are that only one in a thousand are likely to survive to maturity, on a good year. In some years, losses can be nearly complete. 
Individuals that survive that first critical winter, however, have a much greater chance of reaching maturity. Bass begin life as tiny, pearly white fertilized eggs that are adhesive, sticking to the carefully chosen substrate on which they were laid. With constant attention from the tending male, who continuously sweeps away sediment that might smother them, the eggs hatch rapidly in a matter of days. How many days is dependent on the temperature of the surrounding water. 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal, but bass eggs are somewhat resilient in the face of temperature changes. However, sudden drops in water temperature may cause the tending male to abandon the brood. resulting in losses due to suffocation and to predators. Newly hatched fry are bound to a yolk sac that along with a nutrient-packed oil globule provide the nourishment to sustain the very beginnings of the development process. During this short period, over another week's time, the basic tools for a sentient life will develop. Sentience meaning the ability to not only sense the outside world, but to respond to it as well. As hatchlings, and still technically considered embryos, our tiny bass are scarcely sentient. There is little to tip us off to the complex behaviors that make adult bass such adaptable and capable predators. The sensory organs that will connect them to the wider world, their eyes, ears, nostrils, taste buds, and lateral line structures, along with the wiring and motor systems to make use of these powers, have yet to come online. The first behaviors to come online revolve around reflexive movements in response to important outside stimuli. Within mere hours of hatching, with the rudimentary development of what will become the inner ear, our fry become sentient enough to detect the movements of their nestmates and show the first signs of grouping together, the wellspring of social behavior. With the appearance of their first lateral line organs, Fry can then reflexively detect and orient to, or face into, water currents, setting the tiny fish on their way to making use of their hydrodynamic fish-shaped bodies. This ability likely sets the stage for more efficient water flow over the gills, for when the gills become more fully functional. In the early stages, much of their respiration is done through the skin. The gill's initial function will be for osmoionic regulation, the balancing of the fish's sensitive inner chemistry with that of the water around them, something that will remain of vital importance throughout their lives. When their eyes darken as light-capturing retinal pigments form, yolk fry begin to show a reflexive orientation toward light called positive phototaxis. Along with further development of the inner ear, our yolk fry are now able to sit upright in the nest, which is quickly followed by their first horizontal swimming. The inner ear's sensitivity to the inertial forces that self-propulsion generates, coupled with the phototactic response to light gives a fish the ability to orient its body's posture to the environment around it, essentially informing its body of what is down and what is up. 
this automatic reflexive response, known as the vestibulo-ocular reflex, can be seen at work when you lift a live fish from the water. When you do this, you may notice that the fish's eyes appear to be locked in an upward or downward position. But rotate the fish's body side to side, and the eyes reflexively counter the motion. As the retina develops further with the addition of double cone cells, color vision comes online. Color vision occurs before the onset of rod cell or low light and essentially grayscale vision. This is because bass fry are diurnal or day active creatures. Color vision is an adaptation for the discernment of prey and of predators that both come in packages well camouflaged against background lighting. The ability to identify individual objects is something that is about to become of primary importance to these little bass. Low light rod vision will start to develop about a month after hatching, in the fingerling stage, bringing on the beginnings of more capable low light vision in these soon to be multi-talented predators. Enhanced vision, along with further development of the body's motor and wiring systems, also brings online what's called the optomotor reflex, a critically important capability for when the little fry leave the nest and begin swimming. This optomotor reflex gives our fry the ability to stabilize their body's orientation in relation to the apparent environmental motion streaming by around them that comes along with the self-induced motions of swimming. Think of the optomotor reflex as image stabilization, like that found in video cameras. Without it, the motions of our bass could not be separated from the motion of prey and other objects in the environment. Vision and the ability to finely control body motions are critical for the next stage in their lives, becoming predators. With these newfound mechanisms in place and inflation of the swim bladder, our little bass lift off the bottom substrate to become free swimming and begin hunting and feeding themselves. Now up and out of the nest, with their swim bladders inflated, our little bass are called swim up fry, and they are minute roughly six to eight millimeters, or about a quarter of an inch in length. Larval fishes are, in fact, the smallest free-living vertebrates known. Thus, from larva to adult, predatory fish pass through more trophic stages, that is, links in the food chain, than any other vertebrate. At swim up, the yolk sac has been consumed, but the fry retain the oil globule for a few days longer. This oil globule serves as an extended energy packet. They're found in the larvae of many predatory fishes, fishes that live in an energetically costly, high energy lifestyle, requiring high energy foods to compensate. Food items that are a challenge to identify, capture, and subdue. The challenges inherent in getting fed only intensify as our fish grow older and larger. Our tiny swim-up fry now set out to explore a much wider world. And it's here that we begin to see some key foundational behaviors begin to appear. Foundational in that they will carry on through adulthood. They are the foundations of bass social, feeding, predator avoidance, and navigation behaviors.
Bass Fry become aware that they are not alone in the world very early on. As Fry, they are aware of and attracted to their nestmates. Security in numbers plays a big role in individual survival. They begin in what is known as a fry swarm that will eventually break up into smaller groups called shoals. that bass will use throughout their lives. Contrast this loose, more individualistic shoaling behavior of bass with true schooling behavior, the tightly synchronous grouping used by open water species that rely on speed, physical uniformity of individuals, and security in sheer numbers to fend off predators. The attraction to the mass seen in bass fry also appears to expose the rudiments of another foundational behavior, object orientation, that will eventually extend well beyond the initial needs of the swarm. Soon after our bass become mobile, they begin to develop body pigmentation that first comes in as spots and patches over the forepart of the body. By the time they've reached the fingerling stage, they've taken on the coloration and markings of mature bass. As with many biological materials, pigments assume multiple functions. The first pigments in fish fry develop in response to light exposure, serving to block dangerous ultraviolet rays from the sun. As fry and young fingerlings will spend considerable time surface oriented. The dark lateral stripe found on large mouths is a mark commonly shared by fishes that form cooperative shoals. Part of the conjecture is that the lateral stripe not only allows bass to identify each other as bass, but also serves as a type of camouflage by offering a confusing or disruptive visual signal, especially when in motion relative to the observer. There is evidence that bass can identify other bass individually. This is likely done visually, as well as by scent. With their reserves now fully absorbed, energy acquisition through feeding is the free swimming fry's first order of business. In all living creatures, the balance of energy, that is the energy acquired, against the energy expended, is at such a premium that physical and behavioral mechanisms do not evolve or come online in the developmental process without a proven and timely purpose. The importance of vision to bass fry is made plain by the oversized, virtually fully developed eyes they possess at such a young age. Less obvious is the apparent importance of olfaction, or the sense of smell. Olfactory cues have been found to alert tiny bass fry to the presence of prey in their vicinity. They are responding with invigorated swimming, that is, foraging activity. As our bass fry become mobile, olfaction likely allows them to find their way to areas with an abundance of prey, which can often be patchily distributed. Once prey is found to be close at hand, 
The to-do list for our little fry becomes one of identifying, capturing, and ingesting those prey items. Bass fry begin their feeding on zooplankton, minute animals that live suspended in the water column in enormous numbers. However, bass fry appear, even at this early stage in their development, surprisingly choosy about which items drifting in the water column around them they will consider as food, exhibiting the very beginnings of a key cognitive development called foraging selectivity. Foraging theory suggests that expending too much effort capturing and handling difficult prey items, or simply inedibles, is energetically too costly, burning up critical energy stores. That oil globule that gets predatory fishes started burns up very quickly, as soon as our fry become mobile. Physical activity is the most energetically costly thing a fish will do, and this will remain so throughout its lifetime. Fry must not only begin feeding effectively by the time their oil globule is used up, but efficiently as well. And this requires, from the very start, the ability to discern food from not food. So, how do bass fry do it? Identify food from the literal clouds of not food swirling around them. The presence of well-developed sensory organs in our mobile bass fry is only part of the story. The complex job of separating the wheat from the chaff requires the backing of good software to function efficiently. Luckily, each little bass does not need to entirely reinvent the wheel here, as their startup software comes pre-programmed. Bass fry essentially swim up from the nest equipped with a basic search image for tiny prey already in place. In short, a search image provides a basic representative mental model of what passes for food from which a creature can compare against all the other items swirling around it. In bass fry, an object's size and motion appear to be the primary visual cues. And this will remain so for the rest of a bass's life. Prey light reflectance, that is color, plays a role in the identification of food too. If only for the sheer visibility advantages that contrasting color vision provides against background lighting. In our fishing, the inconsistent role that lure color plays in catch rates likely goes a good chunk of the way in explaining why fishing lure color often proves to be more important to anglers than it is to the fish. Or at least more difficult for anglers to tease out the real significance of at any given moment. However, bass will refine their decision-making abilities as they grow and gain experience. Realize that there is more information to be unpacked in those primary visual cues than we might at first assume. Something we'll go after when we delve into the hunting and feeding behavior of adult bass. Adult bass may be marvels of capability and adaptability, but they start out as fry, as one trick wonders. When they first begin feeding, Bass fry employ a rudimentary rote fixed feeding behavior sequence 
to capture their first prey. Let's see what that looks like. Easiest to follow here in these two-month-old fingerlings, but still not much more than an inch and a quarter or 30 millimeters in length. The foundational feeding sequence consists of searching for prey, orienting to the prey item, that is, turning and facing it, fixing on the item, that is, pausing to focus and aim, striking the item, and handling the item, that is, securing it and ingesting it. Now that we know what to look for, here it is again, in fry just days following initial swimming, and still less than a half inch long. We can even make out the tiny fry handling and ingesting the item at the end of the sequence. The almost mechanical execution of the basic feeding sequence exhibited by young fry is effective for the capture of their very first prey, very small zooplankton, just above microscopic in size. The most common types of zooplankton preyed upon by swim-up sized bass are the larger protozoans, and the young of tiny planktonic crustaceans, called nauplii at this early stage in their development. In my waters, here beneath the ice in a small public pond, zooplankton numbers increase greatly through the winter months, when predation levels are at their lowest, providing enormous numbers of them at the time fish larvae appear in the spring. As our fry grow, they soon shift to larger zooplankton, many commonly known as water fleas because of their erratic motions in the water column. This shift is no small feat as these larger creatures introduce their own defensive capabilities to our little fry. Zooplankton defend themselves in a variety of ways through cryptic visual cues via translucence that minimizes light reflectance, acceleration speed, freezing their motion, effective because bass are and will remain primarily motion-activated predators. And through physical defenses such as appendages, spines, and shell shapes that serve to effectively counter mouth gape size in little fishes.
Thus, these larger, more capable zooplankton represent not only a step up in the food chain for our little bass, but also present greater hunting and feeding challenges for them as well. Challenges that add to the energetic costs of doing business incurred by our bass as they grow larger. As our little fry head out into the wider world, the risks to them of starvation represent only half the coming challenge. The next gauntlet to be run will be to not only eat, but not be eaten in the process. The onset of free swimming allows these little fishes the mobility to find and capture prey. But it also exposes them to predators. Until they reach the fingerling stage, our little bass rely on the tending male, their father, for protection from predators. But as our fry develop, we begin to see changes in their behavior. To evade predators, our little bass must become both more aware of and reactive to the world around them. Miss a cue or delay in responding, and life could end instantaneously. The basic escape response in fishes is an automatic, nearly instantaneous, act first, ask questions later, startle reflex to potential threats, such as a sudden movement, sound, or unexpected touch. It comes online early in development, already functional in the fry stage. But as the little fish grow and their sensory and motor capabilities progress, the range at which our little bass can react increases noticeably, as does the speed of their escape responses. The escape or startle reflex in fishes is initiated in mere milliseconds by specialized neurons called Mothner neurons. These uniquely large neurons link the hindbrain's sensory connections and rapid response capabilities directly to the motor system, the trunk and tail muscles that power propulsion. This mechanism can react so quickly because it bypasses the cognitive machinery of the brain. Cognitive regions of the brain do receive the startling input, but assess the event after the response has been executed we can actually see cognition re-emerge in the displays of inspection behavior that commonly follow a false alarm startle reflex. The startle reflex is especially easily triggered by what are called looming objects, the movement of a large nearby object that creates a rapid change in lighting over the fish's visual field, especially dimming as in a shadow being cast. In general, fry grow increasingly sensitive to the outside world. At this time, they also begin to become aware of and are attracted to other prominent objects in the environment, besides the swarm and their father. At this point, such prominent objects serve as secure cover that allows the little fish to better blend in to their surroundings and provides them a ready hiding place when needed. And places to hide will be needed. That's an ages old guarantee. Their father will not be with them much longer. We are a couple months in now, and our little bass have grown into fingerlings. Except for the relative size of their eyes, they could nearly pass for a mature bass, if you ignored the fact that they only average about an inch and a half in length at this early point in the stage. Fingerlings are much more capable swimmers and hunters, and much more aware of the world around them than they were as fry. Commensurate with these developments, 
our little fingerlings begin to expand their range further away from their father's territorial nest site and stretching their father's ability to tend to them to the breaking point. The decision of the male to leave his brood appears to be determined by his physical condition, his ability to be of any further good to himself, and therefore his brood. Highly stressed males have been known to abandon their broods in the fry stage, but healthy males tend to stay on duty into the early fingerling stage. At about two inches in length, the social swarms they lived in as fry begin to break up into smaller groups. This breakup is driven by two main factors. Competition with each other for the larger, less abundant, and more challenging prey these little bass need to continue to grow and develop. And from outright cannibalism. Under the pressure to switch to larger prey, fish prey in particular, Bass have no qualms considering their nestmates as prey. Thus, bass end up grouping by size, because larger bass either outcompete or devour smaller ones. If a given bass is able to reach twice the length of a shoalmate, it can swallow that smaller individual. The aggressive behaviors displayed here that force group breakup are social agonism and direct predation. The heavy plankton-filled bellies on late fry and early fingerlings may make life appear easy on those plankton-rich pastures on which they graze. But growth rates in fingerling bass have been found to be correlated to the relative amounts of large versus small-sized prey items that make it into their stomachs. Thus, there is pressure for bass to select ever larger prey items as they grow. As bass begin capturing and handling ever larger prey, they can be said to be moving up trophic or food chain levels. In the fingerling stage, bass begin to leap through trophic levels, switching from zooplankton to larger crustaceans and insects, and then to fish fry and fingerlings most often within their first summer of life. During this period, our little bass's growing capabilities and trademark large mouths aid in their ability and pace at climbing the food chain. But with each step up in the chain, our little bass are presented with greater challenges in terms of the defensive capabilities and the relative scarcity of these larger prey items. The basic feeding sequence continues, but its execution becomes noticeably more competent in the fingerling stage, more fluid in action, with less time needed for each step, as demonstrated by these three-month-old fingerlings. Here, the orient and fixed steps appear to meld into a nearly single fluid motion, allowing fingerlings to keep up with faster and more evasive prey. You can probably see where this is headed with the development of more efficient, effective, and a wider range of hunting and feeding skills. Skills that presage the multi-talented, behaviorally versatile super predator to come. At these junctures, however, the need to balance basic energetics, energy in versus energy expended, becomes paramount. Thus, bass must be able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the potential prey items they encounter, and adjust their own behavior to effectively and efficiently capture them. Bass must become smarter, as well as faster and stronger. 
selective feeding, the ability to identify and evaluate potential food items, first seen in very young fry, becomes a key step in the cognitive development in these fish. Some of this can be seen in the altered approach phase of the feeding sequence as fish mature, in which different prey items or differing contexts in which they appear may require a different approach. Something we'll revisit in some detail in a future documentary on foraging behavior in adult bass. In terms of evaluating appropriate prey, search templates are still at work, but with further development of the retina in those big spotlight eyes and the appearance of taste buds inside the mouth, selective feeding enlists two allied and soon to be integrated behaviors called inspection and sampling. Inspection is accomplished visually. Sampling by mouth via taste and texture. With enhanced sensory and motor skills in place and developing cognitive tools, the upgraded feeding sequence exhibited by fingerlings begins to run like this. Search, that is, finding appropriate prey. Approach, that is, orient to, close in on, and inspect a potential prey item. Aim and strike, now better able to be accomplished in one motion. Handle the item, that is, secure and then sample the item, meaning to further evaluate it, and then either ingest or reject the item as food or conversely, not food. Thus, little bass begin making decisions the ability to consider alternative courses of action. And the consequences of those decisions opens the door to a profoundly powerful cognitive skill, learning, through positive and negative reinforcements of the individual's actions. Learning entails the ability to ask questions about the environment. Remember objects and actions, their contexts and outcomes, and thereby make more informed decisions in the future. This may come as a surprise to some that fish can learn. But learning, the ability to modify behaviors as a result of experience, to meet variable or novel circumstances and remember them, is an ancient skill. Largemouth bass, in particular, meet the criteria for animals, including fish, that are predisposed to learning as highly adaptable generalist social predators living in complex environments and exposed to a wide range of prey types and sizes over the course of their lifetime. What may come as an even greater surprise is that fish are known to learn from each other, and largemouth bass are no exception. In fact, they may even be exceptional in this regard. We'll get into this subject further, the manifestations of social behavior, in our next episode in this series on the development of behavior, called Making a Living. For now, know that there is much more sophisticated observation and communication between fishes than might be readily apparent when we peer through the water's surface with the naked eye, our sonar, or our fishing lines. 
the development of selective feeding, the decisions, learning, and memory requirements it entails is a developmental milestone, revealing a catalyst for cognitive development in these fish, a concept we'll dig a bit deeper into shortly. Well before they reach maturity, bass become predominantly piscivorous. At this juncture, a whole new chapter begins, and it's an important one. Especially for anglers, if we are to better understand why fish bite, and just as importantly, why they so often don't. Fundamental to this puzzling question is the fact that living high in the food chain is an energetically costly lifestyle. Prey fishes being rich in fats and proteins are essential for rapid growth for bass. But they are also exceedingly difficult to capture. Due to their cryptic or confusing appearance and habits, their vigilance, their speed, their agility, and their ability to defend themselves. The switch to Pisibri is a pivotal period in a young bass's life, as the ability to grow quickly and continually is crucial. That race to beat the clock, remember, has a finish line the onset of winter. Winter is a prolonged period during which bass greatly reduce their activity in feeding. Young of the year bass in particular are at great risk of starving to death or weakening enough that they become easy prey to larger predators. A certain amount of growth and energy accumulation is needed before little bass can survive that critical first winter. Individuals that can find and capture appropriate prey over the course of their first summer obtain the necessary body mass, in particular the lipid or fat reserves from fish prey that can sustain them through the winter. Although top predators like bass are true marvels of capability, so too are their prey. Predation is a battle of opposing limitations in a contest of the more than physically fit. Fitness, in this sense, evolutionary fitness, the ability to meet the prime directive requires more than just raw sensory and motor capabilities, simple reflexes to guide them. The world into which these little creatures are venturing into is too capricious. Too volatile. too complex and too dangerous for simple mechanics. The wider world requires a much more flexible and comprehensive behavioral repertoire. Something called Cognition. Cognition is the process of making sense of the outside world by acquiring, processing, and storing information about that world, and then using it in appropriate ways. 
metacognition is the one profound ability that integrates the entire suite of sensorimotor and physical capabilities into one formidable package. One particularly such formidable package is the largemouth bass, a uniquely adaptable and versatile predator able to make sense of whatever warm water environs they find themselves in. So, what makes sense to a bass? Well, the primary challenges faced by all complex living organisms, like fish, revolve around four main things. Acquiring food, avoiding predators, socializing, and recognizing critical habitat features that promote survival. This powerful ability to evaluate the outside world evolved in answer to the critical need to balance energy in such a complex world. Of the primary challenges from which the cognitive abilities of living creatures are shaped, few are more ancient and still immediately pressing than the acts of finding prey and avoiding predators. Even more challenging is the act of handling both simultaneously. Each require rapid assessment of cryptic and highly capable creatures, their mood, as well as the context in which they appear within the surrounding environment, which must then be responded to by appropriate decision making. The first line of both offense and defense here is what's called attention. Great demands are levied on the sensory system of our little bass by the impressive capabilities of both their prey and of their potential predators. The challenges of finding and recognizing prey, and at the very same time, recognizing and avoiding predators, both compete directly for a bass's attention at every moment. The outcomes at this critical juncture determine who lives to pass on their genes. Attention is a critically and energetically costly cognitive function, so much so that both jobs cannot be handled simultaneously with equal effectiveness. Get too wrapped up in securing food and you run the risk of being eaten yourself. Spend all your time hiding from predators and you will likely starve. The evolutionary arms race has been at work for a very long time and has reached such levels of complexity and sophistication that an animal's sensory and attentional systems are greatly tested from both sides of the food chain. In the fingerling stage, when young bass are becoming increasingly mobile and exploratory, inspection behavior appears in earnest and begins to expand in scope. Inspection behavior, more commonly known as curiosity, is used to focus attention on novel objects 
or circumstances in order to identify them and evaluate their significance. What would be considered cognitively significant to a fish? Again, anything that touches one of the four intensely consequential categories. Prey, predators, social contact, and critical habitat features that promote survival. These are the things that make sense to a fish. So, when a fish decides to approach a novel object, it is asking one of four basic questions. From which to jump off from? Is it food, foe, friend, a habitat feature worth remembering, or is it nothing of interest and able to be ignored? Further questions then might be, is it edible? palatable, can I catch it, can I handle it after I've caught it, is it capable of eating me, is it hungry? Is it an ally? A collaborator? Competitor, or a potential mate. In terms of contexts, can I anticipate food, or danger? The ability to resolve such critically important questions gives a fish, or any living creature, the best chances at survival, possibly even thrival, to meet that prime directive. Thank you.